Live from the Wynn Resort in Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering .next Conference 2016. Brought to you by Nutanix. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. We're back, Lewis Carr Jr. is here, he's the CIO of Clark County. Lewis, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Good to be here. So, what's happening at .next for you? Well, how's the show going? Uh, show's going well. Um, I sat in on the executive track and, and that was interesting. Not so much focused on technology, but on uh, some visionary sorts of things around negotiation. Uh, Robert Gates um, spoke there about his experience um, in, in public sector and his experience you know, in the White House and everything, so that was, that was very interesting. Oh, take us inside a little bit. It was a, <laughs> it was a, a secret super CIO <laughs> private session, but what was the general tone? Negotiation, that's an interesting topic. We had. Uh, uh, Malotra on here. Yes. Well, he was, was a very interesting fellow, right? Right, very interesting. Uh, and just some uh, basic techniques, you know, fairly short session, but some basic techniques on how to set up and how to prepare for uh, negotiations, which uh, as CIOs, whether it's contracts or hardware or even personnel, uh, we negotiate probably every day. And we had Robert Gates on the, uh, the Cube a few weeks ago, out here actually. And uh, of course he was talking about, with us, about leadership. I presume he was talking yes. about that. He's got a new book, yes. Leadership. What did yes. you think? What was your assessment of his remarks? Oh, excellent. I, I mean, he's uh, seen things and done things that most of us will never know about. Pretty humbling, right? Yes, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and, and he talked about leadership. And, and what's interesting is, because he served in federal government, um, it's particularly, I think, relevant to me at county government, some of the challenges we have uh, uh, with staffing, you know, we may not pay like private sector pays for technology folks, um, but nonetheless, we have good folks, and he talked about leadership and aspects of how to keep, how to build new leaders, how to keep uh, staff motivated, so it was good talk. What are some of the things that are driving your organization uh, in terms of county government, some of the, the, the challenges that you're facing, and how does that affect your infor information technology? Yeah, a little bit about the county to, to help you understand um, why we're doing some of the things we're doing. Um, we're a county of about 2.1 million people, um, and in the unincorporated part of the county, which the Las Vegas Strip is part of the unincorporated county, we have about 650,000 uh, residents. So we provide municipal services to those 650,000 folks, and then countywide services like treasurer, assessor, to the 2.1 million, and then public services to the 44 million visitors that come here every year. So we do have uh, a, a complex uh, organization, 39 departments, 50 elected officials, uh, and my responsibility is to manage the technology for most of those departments. So in, in an arena like that, uh, trying to standardize as much as we can, trying to keep the infrastructure as simple as possible, as homogeneous as possible, is one of those driving factors, because that also reduces cost, complexity, reduces downtime, all those things. Hey, can you share with us a little, what, what's the technology environment like here in Clark County? It's like, you know, I've, I've toured the SuperNAP, which is like this phenomenal tour you do. There's, yes. You know, this is the place, I mean, Dave and I in theCUBE, we're here all the time right. for the big technology conferences. So, right. you know, how, how is it as a technology center? Uh, and it is interesting because we're a fairly large county in terms of geography, 8,000 square miles. So certainly the core here, Las Vegas, Henderson, the Strip, um, most of our technology's here, but we still have to extend our technology out to rural areas, Laughlin in the far south, uh, Mesquite, Searchlight, these small towns, but we still offer services. It might be sheriff services, might be court services. We even have a microwave network because our uh, geography is just so large. Um, so um, the, some of the drivers that, that, you know, as we have this large geographic area, most of the, um, most of the technology is here in the urban center. And, you know, we need to make sure we have technology that can support public safety, uh, that supports our public works departments. Every weekend we have, you know, a couple hundred thousand folks coming into town using the highways, using the streets. Um, uh, medical services, you know, ambulance services, we have to provide those. So it's, it's, a, it's truly a 24-hour city for us uh, with a, a population that certainly fluctuates from weekend to weekend and holiday to holiday. 
Well, you've also seen some meteoric growth in the last, last 10, 15, 20 years. And yes. This, this whole area, I mean, it used to be just cranes. Yes. You know? Yeah. Uh, How was that in terms of... That know? was, at, at that time, I wasn't with Clark County, but I was still here in the valley. And to see double-digit population growth year over year for like 10 years was incredible. Like you said, uh, there'd be uh, half a dozen cranes um, uh, building new hotels and things like that. So the population growth, the impact that had on housing costs, and the impact that had on education, you know, possibly putting a strain on the uh, school district here and those sorts of things. Uh, it has been a challenge. Growth, um, growth is sometimes a challenge, especially growth like we experienced uh, back in the 90s. So if the hockey team comes in, is that under your purview? Um, no, and <laughs> it's my understanding that the announcement was made earlier today uh, and, uh, and um, posted on ESPN that we will be getting an NHL hockey team. Awesome, hey, great, yes. but you won't be providing Zamboni services anytime soon. <laughs> no, else is no they'll be playing in a uh, stadium that was privately financed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so you talked about simplifying your infrastructure, standardizing. Yes. I presume that's why you're here at, yes. at Nutanix. Um, obviously, it, it's, uh, you're hearing a lot of messaging about that. Why is that important to you as a CIO? Standard infrastructure, simplify that infrastructure versus you know, tuning that infrastructure for you know, whatever, maximum performance, highest availability, you know, lowest cost for each application. Yeah, in, in a general sense, because again, uh, we're a fairly complex county, we have a number of apps. You know, the application line of business app that social services use is different than the line of business apps that district court uses, and that's different than the line of business app that juvenile detention uses. So all these apps, um, it's very difficult, maybe nearly impossible to tune everything for all these specific apps. So we really like a system that lets us kind of plug and go and has some internal capability of allowing us to uh, do some, uh, I'll call it auto tuning, but more system management at a level where we can monitor system usage, uh, aggregate that. We're trying to transition to a county IT department that's more of a, both a uh, SaaS and IAS, as IAAS, uh, infrastructure as a service, software as a service provider to our 39 departments. What we want them to tell us is their needs. This is what we need in terms of uh, a system or this is what we need in terms of a server and we just provide it. Um, they shouldn't have to know if it's at our main data center, at, at our co-location facility, in the cloud, that shouldn't matter. As long as it's reliable, as long as it's cost effective, and we're meeting their business needs, that's what should matter. So we're trying to install an infrastructure with capacity, a little bit of dynamic capacity, if you would, where we can grow as they need us to grow, shrink as we need them, as they need us to shrink. So is that your vision to build out that service catalog? And where yes. are you in your journey in doing that? Uh, we're probably in the first couple of steps. Uh, we're, we're becoming more mature as it relates to DR. One of the initiatives of coming here for some of my staff is to really learn how Nutanix is able to help us in, in disaster recovery uh, and high availability uh, across a wide area network uh, so that we can establish really kind of this tier zero, our, our core services, DNS, DHCP, uh, AD, across uh, you know, a wide area network with high availability in multiple locations. So we're trying to understand that uh, and that becomes the basis of us to build high availability across the county. Well, that's great. We, it's it, it's really important for companies, uh, you know, and in, in, in agencies to be able to understand the services they supply, having that kind of cloud-like model. Right. Uh, how does public cloud fit into uh, what what you're using and in in, in in deploying? Um, we're we're venturing into that area slow. Uh, we're fairly conservative, um, uh, and and part of it is we have some data that. Uh, uh, we just want to make sure, you know, criminal justice data, things of that nature, we're, we're very cautious of where we put it, where we store it. Um, we'll get there, but um, we're, we're just taking a cautious approach. We are transitioning to uh, exchange in the cloud, though. So that, that's probably our most aggressive well, uh, initiative to date. Well, it's interesting that you say that you're conservative, yet you're using Nutanix, so how, how do you square that circle for us? Well, <laughs> conservative in terms of the management of our data, sure. but uh, progressive in terms of adopting new technology to drive you know, uh, costs down uh, and, and to drive reliability up. 
Yeah, can, can you speak to what, what's your experience been on that cost model? Uh, obviously from an operational standpoint, we understand the simplicity. Do, do you have any kind of TCO metrics or you know, even the solution itself, some people will say, oh, you know, that acquisition of a hyperconvergence you know, cluster is not inexpensive, so uh, what's your experience been? Yeah, and we're still building some of those cost metrics, um, but there are a couple of things that we have seen. Uh, one is just because of the uh, uh, compact nature of the hyper-converged technology in our colo facility, where we would have used like two or three racks, we're just using half a rack. So that's a hard cost savings yeah, every absolutely. month. Uh, you know, the gift that keeps on giving, we like to say. Um, as it relates, we're still developing cost models as we develop more maturity around management of the uh, Nutanix infrastructure. We're going to be looking at Prism Pro to see how some of those uh, capacity tools can help us, capacity planning tools can help us uh, with hitting our metrics in terms of uh, cost, in terms of performance, in terms of showback model. My department, we charge back for all of our services. So I want to get in a better position to show back to the users what they're using, storage, CPU, network, all those things. Then they can adjust their usage based on, uh, based on the information we give them. So they, we're putting the power in their hands to control their costs. So you, you charge back as a, a blob or like you have some kind of ratio based on budget or users or? Yeah, it, it's not as, uh, it doesn't have the fidelity that I'd like for it to have, uh, so it's kind of uh, an average right now, yeah. uh, number of users, uh, and we, you know, uh, for simplicity's sake, um, it's not terribly accurate, but it's easy to understand. Yeah, so, but, they, but, but the, 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 your consumer can't really act on it right. and, and make decisions. Right. It's kind of like our healthcare. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So we want to get there. exactly. Right. We want, and in some cases they can. Some cases we've been able to identify systems that are exclusively used by one department, and then we can charge them back, and then they can choose to downsize that system or increase that system. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I'd like to get into a position where more of our services we have that level of fidelity. Where to your point they can make a business decision to cut back on this, expand on that, based on what their business needs are. Yeah, that's, that's great. So you're basically replicating a cloud-like model, public cloud-like model right. within your own uh, infrastructure. Exactly. Building service catalogs, right. being more responsive, like you said, self-service. Right. Well, or quasi-self-service. How will that work if somebody wants to compute You'll spin it up for them, or yeah, um, just to keep it under control? Or? We'll spin it up, but the, the long-term future would be there might be some sort of a portal where almost like an Azure sort of thing where they could go on, they would specify what they needed, how long they needed it, and when it was spun up, we'd be, you know, the clock would be ticking, uh, like the meter on the taxi cab. When they shut it down, they'd be presented with their bill. So again, it's in their hands to manage their costs. So, uh, if you had a but chance, that's a ways off. Have you had a chance to look at the announcements that they made this week? Anything that kind of stood out for you? And uh, also, I'm curious, are you using the Acropolis hypervisor? Uh, we are not at this point, uh, and I am not that technical, so some of the announcements uh, go over my head, but I do have a, about two or three of my folks here, and they're really excited about some of the announcements that you guys have had. So um, uh, we've had some discussions about how the new technology will help us kind of stabilize more of the Nutanix uh, environment. We're looking at acquiring more uh, for VDI. Some of our short-term initiatives are a proof of concept around VDI using Nutanix. Uh, we're also looking at, as I mentioned, high availability. We're, we hope by the end of the year to have a proof of concept done around high availability for one of our line of business apps as well. So um, they're hearing solutions here that will help us accomplish those goals. Great, one of the trends we'd seen for a while is there'd been some consolidation of the stack. Um, Nutanix is you know, a relatively young mm -hmm. player, so if you're, you're buying them, you're still using lots of others. I know uh, you're, you're using SAP, you're using right. other environments. How do you look at Nutanix as a partner, uh, and how do they fit into kind of your other partnerships that you have from a technology standpoint? Yeah, as, as I look at uh, kind of the strategy for Clark County, um, it is about uh, standardization and uh, consolidation from a hardware and software perspective, uh, whether it's SAP, uh, we're using ServiceNow as our ITSM solution. Uh, instead of buying all these one-offs, we'd like to really leverage the tools we have more. 
uh, to reduce our application footprint. Um, that has the advantage of one, reducing cost, but two, developing deeper expertise for the staff. Instead of a programmer having to know 10 different tools, if he or she can learn one or two tools, they can become uh, better experts at that tool. It was interesting at the CIO panel this morning, you know, the interviewer was invoking the career is over rubric. <laughs> um, but there was discussion about the role of the CIO. So I don't, I don't want to go to career is over, but, but there was useful discussion, I think, around uh, the role of the CIO in terms of technical CIO mm -hmm. versus more business oriented. You mentioned just now you're not a, a technical CIO, you're not a CTO. Right. Um, so how do you see that role evolving? Uh, it, it's actually one that we've talked about a lot on theCUBE where, where the, C, the technical CIO, we see going more to a CTO role. Right. And the CIO becoming more of a you know, business, you're in a, you know, right. a government organization, right. but it's still business, you know right. what I mean by that. Business process. So you are a business right. process CIO, is that right? Or? Yeah, and I do have two deputies. Uh, I would consider them, in today's terminology, CTOs. And they report to you? Yes, they do. Uh, so my job, I spend most of my time um, interacting with the, the department heads, assistant department heads, executives, elected officials, to understand you know, uh, what's driving our business, how can we improve customer service, uh, and both me and my deputies meet with department heads and, and various folks throughout the county. But uh, I spend the majority of my time uh, focusing on how we can enable the business to do things better, faster, cheaper. Uh, and I take those uh, conversations back to my CTOs and then they figure out which technology matches up best. So you're essentially all building relationships with your customers, turning those, in, understanding the requirements, turning those into actual services. Yes. And you're the middleman of sorts. Right. Making that all happen. And of course right. you've got a management role as well, so you've got a stick <laughs> that you can use. Yes. Um, okay, so. And I think increasingly, would you agree, that's the role of the, the CIO, is translating those requirements into services and, and getting delivery. Yeah, and there's also this uh, secondary CIO role, Chief Innovation Officer. Um, I'm, I consider myself that role as well, uh, as I talk to other departments and they talk about uh, solutions they've seen at conferences that they've attended. Uh, software solutions, hardware solutions. Uh, I work with them to try to create, uh, again, to innovate in their departments, um, whether it's uh, the social services folks and mobility initiatives, uh, or it, it may be some other initiative in other departments where we're really trying to maybe take a couple steps back and, and to your point, we're looking at uh, their process. What are they trying to accomplish? Uh, regardless of the technology initially, but what, what's driving this new line of business or what's driving this new service? Uh, is it you know, a regulation that's come or they have metrics that show that they can do things better? And then we look at how our technology can help them drive towards their performance goals. What about, um, what about the CISO? Does, does the CISO, do you have a CISO? Does, yes. Does he or she report into you? Yes, uh, he oh. does. Okay, um, so that's an interesting discussion, right? Yeah, and, and I've seen, and, but we have a great collaborative group around security. Uh, myself, my CISO, the risk management director, uh, and the district attorney. So Who obviously uh, do not report it to you. <laughs> right, right, who do not report to me. But we collaborate on a number of things as we look at policies around uh, information security, around uh, uh, you know, PCI, um, Siegis, um, so this group of people, uh, you know, it's, it's a good mixture of technical folks and again, the risk manager and her understanding of what level of risk the county is willing to take on for certain types of initiatives and the district attorney, his understanding of, of what is required by Nevada revised statute, all that plays in into how we build our security program. So that's an interesting regime. So, you know, a lot of people will say, well, the CISO, should have latitude, maybe they're reporting to the CISO, CIO, maybe not, but they should have latitude because otherwise it's the fox watching the hen house. Right. But you've got a regime that involves risk management, so it's an integral part of risk management, and you got a legal expert right. involved. To whom do you all, I don't want to say report, but to, to whom do you communicate 
about what's going on with cybersecurity? Is there, what's the uh, overseer board? Uh, and, and part of my role is to have that communication, the discussion with the uh, executive oversight board, the county manager, the two assistant county managers, the CFO, and the CAO, who I report up to. CAO is chief administrative, administrative officer. Okay. Yes, and that's essentially the the top dog of the organization. Is that right? right? Uh, a lot of the uh, internal services report up to her. And and so that board that you just described, how tuned in are they to cyber, and has that level of signal increased over the last several years? Um, I think they're fairly well tuned in. I have quarterly meetings um, with the entire board where we go over initiatives. Um, of course, every other week I'm meeting with my boss and I keep her abreast on uh, initiatives that we're working on. And we have a handful of uh, technology initiatives around security now, PCI compliance, uh, identity and access management. Uh, we're going to be rolling out, uh, we've done a pilot and we're going to be rolling out a whitelisting software to complement our antivirus software. Uh, we're also doing some things around two-factor authentication. So that's part of my security portfolio. Uh, and they're, I'd say they are well engaged because they've given me the funding to move forward. So I report back to them on the progress on all these initiatives. How much discussion, Lewis, goes on with regard to responding to incidents? And how much of, of, of that funding goes to the response plan? I presume you're the leader of that response plan. Right, but, in but fact, we're uh, tweaking our um, cyber response plan now, uh, both internal within the county proper and because we're government agencies and we work close with a number of others, we're looking at an intra-agency uh, plan as well because uh, there are some dependencies uh, that we have on other government agencies and that they have on us. Uh, so we're starting to explore and, and we'll be building out an intra, uh, an inter-agency um, cyber response plan. Do you soon. test you know, your response? Um, you know, like testing DR, right? Do you, right. Do you practice, you know, responding? Uh, it, it's still in the formulative stages. Um, uh, unfortunately, we've had to use it once or twice. Uh, so I practice would say by that, fire. <laughs> yes, I would <laughs> say that uh, it has been tested. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but is that part of the formal funding process? I mean, they give you funding to sort of secure the perimeter and right. probably do other things, but. Right. But is it an explicit sort of line item, if you will, for, for practicing, like a fire drill? No, it, no it's just it part, uh, it, it's not an explicit line item, it's kind of just baked into the program. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's part of the, the regime. Right. It's a fascinating topic, and it, and it seems to be changing, right? I mean, it used to be all about protect the perimeter, right. thwart penetration, and now right. it's much more about res response and responding and, and right. communicating. Yeah, it, it is so difficult uh, because sometimes the threat might be from within. So how do you respond uh, both from an internal threat and an external threat? Uh, and having that um, response plan in place and, and like you said, uh, practiced so that you know it works. All right, Lewis, we're out of time, but I'll give you the last word on, uh, talk about the, the conference here, things you've learned, things you'll take back to your team. Uh, things I've learned, um, part of the, the, the great thing about most of these conferences that I attend is meeting other public sector folks. So I've, I've met a number of folks, uh, uh, ASU, uh, A&M, um, uh, City of Houston, uh, Harris County. So we're all starting to network so that we can uh, share ideas. You know, granted, uh, Nutanix, we can call them, they can give us great ideas. Uh, but having other public sector agencies that we can call and say, how did you handle this? Not only from a technology perspective, but also from a, a procedure and policy perspective. Um, Nutanix probably wouldn't know how or why government right, procedures right. and policies are the way they are, but I can call Harris County or I can call Orange County. And, and the, if they're using the technology, then we can share ideas. It's all about the peers. Yes. Bringing you content from .next to the peer group uh, within the SiliconANGLE community. Lewis, thank you very much for coming on theCUBE. My really pleasure, appreciate it. my pleasure. <clears throat> All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back to wrap right after this short break.